This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Welcome, everybody, to the Human Action Podcast. I am going to go solo this episode and respond to a recent post from Brian Kaplan. Before I dive in, let me just apologize for my voice. Uh, I feel a lot better than I sound, put it that way. But yeah, I had a bad cold that's moving around my system, and right now it's smack dab in my voice box. So the background to this is a Matthew Gagnon had emailed Brian, um, and Brian let him do a, a guest post at Brian's, uh, I don't know if it's a sub stack or what his blogging platform is, and was asking Brian, hey, long ago in 1997, you wrote this essay called Why I'm Not an Austrian Economist, and lots of us in the Austrian school have discussed Brian's critique back then, and the backstory is that when Brian was younger, he was a huge Austrian, right? And he you know, went to conferences and was giddy around Murray Rothbard and so forth. And then when he learned mainstream neoclassical economics in his formal studies, became, I don't know if disillusioned is the right word, but realized, oh, wait, there's a whole universe out there of good economists and you know the Austrians don't have a monopoly on that. And then that's what he wrote this, why I'm not an Austrian economist essay to explain why he no longer was a card-carrying member, even though he still respected, you know, a lot of his Austrian friends and colleagues. Okay, so this guy, Matthew Gagnon's then asking Kaplan, hey, it's uh, many years later, wh- wh- how do you still feel about that? So I thought this was an interesting thing. And a few people have asked me to chime in on this. So sure, why not? And of course, if you want to see Brian's original post. I can link to it in the show notes page here. All right. So in response to Gagnon saying nearly three decades have passed since you wrote your essay, distancing yourself from the Austrian school, what do you still hold these views? And then Kaplan says, my fundamental position has barely changed. I'm great friends with many Austrians, and I think they make some good points, but their attempt to philosophically debunk mainstream economics and provide a new foundation for the discipline is a failure. Okay, so let me just respond even right there. You might have thought, okay, we're just getting warmed up. But what he just said right there, I think, is mistaken. And it just his framing of the issue partly explains why I think Brian and I are disagreeing on this and why many of today's card-carrying Austrians would not agree with Brian's take here. And specifically, it's he's saying, the Austrians attempt to philosophically debunk mainstream economics and provide a new foundation for their dis- or for the discipline. And so the reason I think that that's framing it wrong, or at least the standard Austrians today would disagree with that, is it was not the case that economics developed and then in the 1940s, Mises shows up and says, oh, I don't like this. Instead of you guys doing it the way economics has been built, instead, why don't you do it this way? And we'll call it praxeology. And I have all of my methodological problems with the way you guys have developed economics until I came on the scene. That is not at all what happened. All right. Mises, in his early career, when he was explaining the method of economics, he was not offering it as a prescription. He was not saying, this is what I think you guys ought to be doing. Instead, he was trying to distill, to codify how economics had developed to that point. And if you're interested in reading more of this and seeing evidence rather than me just asserting it, the single best uh, place I can point you is Hans Hoppe's essay on the... um, the method of the Austrian school. Okay. So I'll, I'll link to that. And there, there's a lot that he does in that little essay. Um, but it's among other things. What Hoppe does is he says that this method of praxeology of, um, I mean, there's, there's various ways of doing this intuitively, like using thought experiments, right? Just thinking through the logical deductions of, 
of various concepts. Okay, so in the specifically Misesian framework, you start with the action axiom, and then you start deducing things from that. But just in general, the idea of like, hey, how should we think about tariffs? Well, if you took the way a lot of mainstream economists talk about, oh, the reason our discipline is so scientific is because we make a hypothesis and then that has testable implications and we go look at the data and see. But no, the, if you're in favor of free trade, it's not because you looked at a bunch of regressions. It's because you just thought through, like you read some Bastiat essays or maybe you read uh, you know, David Friedman and his Iowa car crop example. In case you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a clever um, idea that uh, I, apparently David Friedman invented it, but Steve Landsberg popularized it in one of his books. Um, and so I think it was Armchair Economics was Landsberg's book that popularized this notion. And so the idea was, um, just to give you an example of what I mean, that's why I'm going on this tangent, that if you think that um, international, if if you think that the benefit of protectionism is that it protects U.S. jobs, and so that's why we might want to have a, a tariff on Japanese auto imports to provide jobs for Detroit auto workers, you can think of it in a different way and say, oh, just there's different technologies for making cars. And one technology is U.S. workers go to factories in Detroit and we send in some steel and glass and rubber and blah, blah, blah. And then cars cr come out. That's one technology. That's one way we've discovered of how to produce automobiles for Americans to drive. But there's another way we've done it. And a bunch of farmers in Iowa grow some crops. Then they put them on a ship. The ship goes across the ocean. And then it comes back and it's got a bunch of cars on it that are all of Japanese design. And that's another technological way we have for using our workers and resources to make cars. And so at that level of abstraction, it, you know, if you're just looking at two different technologies, the fact that one of them involves, you know, shipping it across the ocean and then it quote transforms into Japanese cars when it comes back is incidental. Okay. And so on that level, like you see, uh, penalizing the second technology would simply um, hurt the Iowa farmers, right? So it's not that you're you're benefiting one group of, or it's not that you're helping U.S. workers in general with the high protective tariffs. No, you're helping Detroit auto workers, but you're there by penalizing the Iowa farmers, right? So that's the idea. So uh, another example is Henry George had a famous quote, I might not get the exact quote right, but saying what's interesting is during wartime, what we do to our enemy is what we do to ourselves during peacetime when it comes to so-called protective trade barriers, right? If you're at war with some other country and you have a superior Navy, what do you do? You blockade them. You try to stop stuff from getting into their country. So if protectionism is right, aren't you doing them a favor? And now, oh, now we're going to raise the wages of their workers and, you know, provide the stimulus to all of their infant industries by us keeping cheap imports from seeping into their country. No, everyone knows when you're at war with some other country and you blockade them, you're hurting them. Right. And it's also not because you're stopping their exports and so they can't raise foreign exchange. No, it's that vital imports that they need for their country. You know, you're preventing from getting in there. You're starving them out or whatever. Okay, so just examples. My point is, whatever you think of international trade, if you know, maybe you're like tariffs because they can reduce income taxes, or I'm saying with all that stuff, 95% of the arguments are going to be in the form of thought experiments and just conceptually framing the issues and making sure, oh, wait a minute, there's this other effect we got to keep track of. And very little of it is going to be, let's make a model that's going to have testable implications and then go look at the data and not because we're blind and just put our head in the sand and we don't want the real world to give feedback on our dogmatic assumptions. That's not why it's that when it comes to the social sciences, things are so complex and it's so difficult to have a truly controlled experiment that that method just isn't very reliable.
right? To this day, Keynesians and Austrians disagree about the Obama stimulus. The, the Keynesians will look at the exact same data on employment and you know, GDP growth and blah, 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 and say, yeah, the Obama stimulus saved or created this many millions of jobs. And the Austrians can look at the same data and say, what are you talking about? No, it didn't. Da, 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 da. Right? It's because we're comparing it to the counterfactual. Given the way the Keynesians view the world, they're going to say, had it not been for the, Kane, uh, the Obama stimulus package, this many uh, jobs would have been lost and unemployment would have jumped up this amount. But because of the Obama stimulus package, unemployment only rose to such and such. Right? Whereas the Austrians can say, no, given our model of how the world works, the Obama stimulus package made things worse. And I would say we have a good reason to say that because in this particular example, the Keynesians going into that, it was the famous Christina Romer and Jared Bernstein analysis is the chief uh, economic advisors to the you know, incoming Obama administration. And they made the case for the stimulus package showing if we do nothing, unemployment might reach this level. And guess what? They did the stimulus package and unemployment was worse than what they warned would happen in the absence of the package. But they just spun it and said, oh, geez, the economy was in worse shape than we realized. It's really good that we did that stimulus package. Okay, so my point is, that you can't settle these things using the so-called scientific method the way it's taught in sixth grade because there's not controlled experiments. Really, to do it correctly, you would need to have a time machine and go back and say, okay, let's have the exact same situation, and now we won't do the Obama stimulus package, and let's see what happens. And then you could truly see what is the impact of the stimulus package. But in practice, we can't do that. All we know is there were 19,000 different things going on, one of which was the Obama stimulus package, and then this was the outcome. And so depending on your worldview and your existing framework of your model of how the economy works, you're going to pick and choose, okay? So that's the idea. So again, uh, if you want to see more, what Hoppe does is he quotes from various um, 19th century economists to show that this idea of, hey, the way we proceed in economics is by thinking through the logical implications of certain concepts or principles to come up with a body of economic law that's not, it's not the same, it's not just pure math, but it's also not physics or chemistry or even history. It's something else and what, it, well, it's economics. And, and Hoppe does a good job of showing that, you know, Mises was not, inventing this out of whole cloth, that he was just, again, trying to distill and codify what the method was among the good economists coming out of the classical tradition. And so, yes, at some point, it was true during the 20th century that the mainstream professional economists in academia and, you know, advising government and so forth pivoted away from that, and they engaged in what we would call physics envy and tried to make it look very scientific. And, oh, yeah, see, we're just like the physicists. And even there, they were kind of aping decades prior of physics. They weren't actually copying what the cutting-edge physics of the day was. But that was not where economics came from. Okay, so again, it's my point is just Brian is making it look like the economics profession grew up and then the Austrians came along and said, oh, we think that you guys are idiots. You should do it this way. And that's, that's not really what was going on. The, the Austrians in the Misesian tradition, I think, can correctly claim that, no, we have maintained the mantle. We've, we've carried the torch of classical sound economics and just improved it with you know, subjective value theory, like the, the shortcomings of the classical approach. And it's the mainstream now that branched off and started doing methodologically dubious things. And I think we could say, and look what they have to show for it, right? It's not that uh, they got rid of the business cycle, right? What, in U.S. history, what are the two worst examples of the business cycle? It's the Great Depression and the Great Recession. And that happened, you know, after the Fed was created and... Even in the second example, it was after they said, okay, okay, give us a mulligan. We got it. That won't happen again. And oops, yeah, it did.
Okay, so it's it's not at all clear that the economic profession has anything to show for them aping the methods of the natural sciences. Whereas, you know, the physicists can pat themselves on the back. You know, they can say, hey, do what you will with it. Maybe it's a good thing or a bad thing in terms of morality, but we showed you how to blow stuff up. You know, we can do a look at modern computers. There's a lot of stuff that the natural sciences have achieved, whereas the economics profession, it's not at all clear what they have to show for their devotion to the scientific method and empiricism. And I think to this day, even Brian Kaplan and, um, you know, David Friedman, I, I debated David Friedman at Porkfest one year on this. I'll link to that too, folks, on this narrow question of, of method and economics, that the best stuff from Friedman, and even I would say the best stuff from his dad, it's not empirical studies and, oh, here's what the elasticity of the demand for potatoes is, and that's why, blah, blah, blah. No, the, the solid free market understanding of how the world works and why interference with the market is going to lead to undesirable consequences, 95% of that comes from just thinking through the implications of certain, you know, the effect on incentives and things like that. So again, you need some general backdrop of empirical feedback. You need to understand that people like leisure and things like that. And oh yeah, sometimes employees steal from you, so you got to be careful. And da, da, da. Okay. But my point is the way the mainstream economist explains what it is they do in economics and what the method is, and they make it sound like it's, we come up with our hypothesis and have testable, that, that's not what they do in practice, even among them. Like, why were they attracted to economics in the first place? Okay. Um, moving through this, Matthew asked Brian, has your perspective evolved in light of new developments in the field or through interactions with your colleagues? And Brian says, the biggest non-fundamental change is my view of Austrian business cycle theory. My original critique relied heavily on the rational expectations assumption. And as I put it, so now here Brian's quoting from his 97 essay, given that interest rates are artificially and unsustainably low, why would any businessman make his profitability calculations based on the assumption that the low interest rates would prevail indefinitely? No, what would happen is that entrepreneurs would realize that interest rates are only temporarily low and take this into account. And then now Brian, in modern times here, is responding to his quote and saying, as I've learned more empirical psychology, I've become more open to the idea that the rational expectations assumption is false, even when incentives for rationality are high. Upshot, I'm less inclined to dismiss Austrian business cycle theory out of hand, but instead of making me accept their specific story, I'm now more open to a vast range of macroeconomic stories that rely on irrationality. Da, 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 da. Okay, so he goes through. Okay, so my response there is I agree with Brian that the standard way canonical Austrian business cycle theory is explained to people, and I've done this too, is along, I'm paraphrasing here, but the story often goes like this, and then I'm going to explain the issue with it. So yeah, the story goes, hey, in the Austrian tradition, uh, interest rates serve a vital function in coordinating production and consumption decisions over time. Loosely speaking, if the public if, is... Uh, more willing to defer immediate gratification for long-term gratification, then they save more, that lowers interest rates, that frees up resources today for investment in longer projects, and that's how everything is synchronized. And so the public's willingness to defer gratification physically frees up resources for longer projects so that those that higher volume of goods and services comes out of the pipeline down the road at a, at a further date in the future, it all sinks together. So the producers are acting on behalf of the changed preferences of the, of the consumers, right? But now that I've said that framework, what happens if the reason the interest rate drops is not because of genuine saving on the part of the public, but just because the banks create more money and, and, and it enters the economy through the credit markets. And so that pushes the interest rate artificially low, 
So that still gives the same signal to the entrepreneurs to go ahead and expand the production structure, the, the length of it. But the public actually hasn't become more patient. And so now there's a mismatch between the public's desire for the flow of consumption over time and what the producers are making the capital structure start producing. And that's what it, it leads to, a, you know, a temporary period of prosperity where it seems that, um, you know, businesses are bidding away workers from consumer lines. And so wages are rising. Everything seems profitable. But that's based on an illusion. And ultimately, there's capital consumption going on behind the scenes to make it physically possible to do that for a few years. But eventually, the crisis hits. Okay? And then you say, oh, and so the, the banks get skittish. They stop pumping in all this new artificial credit. Interest rates rise to the actual fundamental level. And then the businesses realize, uh-oh, we shouldn't have engaged in such grandiose projects and the crisis sets in, right? So what I just said there is a, a decent version of if you were going to explain the Austrian business cycle theory to a lay audience for the first time, just to give them the essentials of it. So Brian is right that in that story, it's a little bit dubious because you might say, okay, maybe that could have happened a few times, but eventually don't the entrepreneurs, especially like if they listen to your YouTube channel, Murphy or whoever, don't they know that that's part of how it works now? And so if the banks pump in artificial credit and lower interest rates, don't the entrepreneurs realize that? And so won't they only invest, you know, taking that into account? And so won't that offset? Okay, so that's f fine insofar as it goes, but there have been a couple of responses over the years to that. So one thing is the, um, to sort of give like a prisoner's dilemma analysis that um, says it, given that the banking system is handing out cheaper credit, if, if you just refrain from taking it, your competitor is going to go in and take it, right? So it's, it's not that everybody's going to just not take the loans given that the banks are now reducing the rate of interest and, and handing out more. And so that's certainly not the, the issue. It's not that the, the banker or the business people can all just say, oh, no, 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 we're, we're only going to borrow the same amount. Okay, so then beyond that, though, there's the problem that I specifically raised against this objection to the Austrian business cycle theory is that it's ignoring – the uh, coordinating function of market prices in the first place. Like, I mean, because if it were really the case that all the business people could just look at the raw data and say, oh, okay, I looked at M2 and the base stock and blah, 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 and the Fed did this. And so really, even though the market interest rate right now on a given maturity or whatever of a treasury or whatever you want to use as your benchmark is 3%, Really, if we back out all of the monetary inflation and so forth, the credit expansion, really, I should behave as if the market interest rate is 4.8%. Well, but how, if you could do that, well, then you wouldn't need interest rates in the first place, right? Central planning would work if business people could do that. Okay, so the idea is you can't have it both ways. If market prices are communicating information and helping everybody coordinate and align incentives and so forth, and then somebody comes along and says, oh, and now there's this distortionary force from credit expansion where it's giving the wrong signal. It's not enough just to say, oh, the entrepreneurs would know that and they would take it into account. So in fairness, you, you, know, you could have a sort of a hybrid compromise position and say, yes, the business people take that into account, but still the signal is noisier now than it otherwise would be. And I actually did try to model that it ended, I ended up not getting it published, but um, at some point, you know, maybe in my re doting uh, retirement years, I'll go back and try to nail that thing down and, and get it published. But the idea is you, you could come up with some kind of model about, yes, the signal becomes noisier, and so it still distorts things. And I think that might actually be accurate. And the other kicker in this is suppose the central bank is trying to inflate in order to stimulate the economy. 
they could do a burst of it. And if that doesn't have the desired effect, they could just keep doing more and more. Right. And I think you actually saw that during the Obama years with the various rounds of QE that I think in the beginning, the Fed thought, oh, this is going to juice things. And then it didn't have the effect that they had anticipated. And so they kept dumping in more. So I think Brian is right that the business people, once they catch on to what's happening, can anticipate. But again, it doesn't, that doesn't mean they can perfectly offset it. And then the last thing I'll say is, I mean, you can call this, Brian talks about like behavioral science and the Austrians need to study more psychology. And I mean, I don't, I don't think so. Here, I just want to appeal to the fact that there are different types of people in the market, right? So to give you a, a real world example, after the housing bubble collapsed, I was talking to uh, the guy who actually built the house I was living. I was in Nashville at the time. And he was saying, you know, he, he was an older guy. And he's saying that, oh, yeah, I've lived through previous housing busts, and I saw this coming, right? So he was a builder, and this guy was, like, in his 60s at this point. And so he said that, yeah, in, like, 2006, he knew we were in a housing bubble, and so he started backing off, that he wasn't starting a bunch of new projects. He was just kind of wrapping up. He was keeping his inventory low, in other words. And so he was finishing projects and selling them off before starting new ones. And then in our neighborhood, there were a bunch of houses that were like half finished and then they just came to a dead stop once the crisis hit. And then, you know, they were just at a dead stop for a while and then, like, you know, they had to get liquidated and sold and then somebody finally did something with it. And so he was telling me that, oh yeah, the, the kids doing that, he called them kids, but they were, you know, probably like in their late 20s. He was just saying they just, they've never lived through a housing bubble before. They didn't realize it was a bubble. And so they were just making money hand over fist and just starting and getting levered and starting as many projects as they could, not having the experience. So the point being, in the real world, yes, the more experienced, wiser entrepreneurs might avoid the temptation of cheap credit, but they can't stop other people from stepping forward and saying, oh, yeah, I'll borrow money at that rate. And with these calculations, okay, we can do this and that. All right. So that's that's kind of the idea that I... If Brian wants to call that, you know, going and studying the psychology literature, okay. But to me, I don't, I don't think that's really what you need to do. And also, I again, going back to the conception of what economics is, starting with general principles and just deducing them logically, that's what praxeology is. And that's a distinct field from psychology. So I don't agree with Brian that, oh yeah, the, the Austrians need to bring in insights from empirical psychology. I think that's, that, you know, that'd be like saying in geometry class, oh, we need to bring in developments in psychology. And like, no, that would just, you'd be misunderstanding what geometry is. Okay. So at the end here, I'll just read these and then give my quick reaction. Brian says, if I had my way, how would Austrian economists reform their behavior? All the following. There's going to be six of these things. One, stop being amateur philosophers. Quantitative probability theory is fine. Indifference curves are fine. Two, learn and internalize a lot of empirical psychology. Three, use the psychology they learn to reformulate their criticisms of mainstream neoclassical economics. Four, stop worrying about what Hayek, Mises, and Rothbard really meant. History of thought just doesn't matter much. Five, use Hayek, Mises, and Rothbard not to find the answers, and the answers are, is in caps, but to fuel your imagination. Intellectually, Hayek is virtually my least favorite Austrian economist, but by the power of imagination to my continuing amazement, this rambler inspired both Wikipedia and crypto. And then finally, six, direct your imagination toward radical libertarian policy ideas I doubt I have written either Open Borders or Build Baby Build. Those are two of Brian's books. If I'd never read The Austrians, while there's nothing distinctively Austrian about either book, reading Austrian Economist has helped me see unconventional free market possibilities I would otherwise have overlooked. It can and should help Austrians do the same. Okay, so my reaction uh, to these, as far as the stop being amateur philosophers, Quantitative probability theory is fine. Indifference curves are fine. Again, I, Brian is misunderstanding 
the critique on the indifference curve stuff. Okay. That the Austrian, so let me back up in mainstream economics, a, t a common way to explain consumer behavior is you map out indifference curves. And then you t have the person's budget constraint, which is, you know, their income. And then you take into account the price. Like, let's say it's two goods. And so you got on the X, Y axis and you draw some curves showing each particular line shows all the bundles of good X and good Y that provide the same amount of utility. And so that's why they're indifference curves because it's saying the individual would be indifferent all along this particular curve. And so if you move to the Northeast, jumping up to higher and higher curves, you're g gaining more utility because you assume that these are goods. And so the individual wants more of both. Okay. But then the actual shape of the curve shows the, the trade-off, right? So as, as you go to the Northwest, the curve gets really steep because it's showing as you get less and less of good X, you need more and more units of good Y in order to keep you indifferent. And then if you keep going to the right, the curve gets very shallow for the opposite reason that if you're going down on the Y axis, you're getting less and less of good Y, you need more and more units of X to keep you indifferent, right? So that's kind of the idea. And so then you, you go ahead and you do that, you map that out, and then you say, oh, so how do we know what the consumer's actually going to buy or demand? Then you say, oh, well, what's the consumer's total money income? And then what if the consumer spent it all on good X? And so that gives you your, you know, your max X point with a zero Y. And then what if you spent all the income on good Y? And so that gives you your you know, zero comma Y coordinate. And then you just connect the two with a straight line, right? And so all of those bundles on that straight line are in the budget set. They're all affordable given the consumer's income and the price of the two goods. And so then the question is just one of geometry now. You say, oh, so the optimal bundle, the, you know, the, the bundle that is affordable and maximizes utility is wherever that budget line is tangent to an indifference curve, okay? And so that's the way you proceed with consumer theory like at the undergrad level, certainly in an intermediate level, you know, for the, the students that are econ majors at the, at the under, but it's still at the undergrad level. Okay. So that's the way you do it. And so the Austrians have a lot of, at least in the Misesi and Rothbardian vein, have a lot of problems with that in terms of just the big picture headline is to say it's, it's explaining consumer choices by reference to indifference. And they're saying that's, no, people don't choose on the basis of indifference. They choose on the basis of preference, right? So in the standard Misesian approach, action is choosing one thing over another, and that's the starting point. And so they don't like the, just the basing consumer choice theory on indifference. And so... In response to that, Brian, in his original 97 essay, just starts talking, well, no, there's lots of times you could be indifferent between things. And, you know, I might have like two, I think this is the example, I might have two sweaters, you know, I have to put on a sweater, I'm going outside, and they might be hanging in my closet, or maybe they're in my drawer, and I really don't care, you know, between the two of them, and I just pick one. And, yeah, that's, that's fine, but even there, it's not that you're choosing because of the indifference, right? So he's missing the point. It's not saying that everyone has to have a strict preference based on every single characteristic of something, right? And, the, the, and this kind of ties into like the definition of a unit of a good. So if you want to say, like, I have eight units of, of water, and the first unit of water I'm going to devote to drinking, and the second unit I'm going to devote to bathing, and the third I'm going to devote to cooking, and the fourth I'm going to devote to washing my dog and the fifth to the, my washing my car and the sixth to watering my lawn, and, right? You can do that. And each thing is devoted to a less important end. And that's where like the law of diminishing margin utility comes in. But when we say there, like, what, what do you mean they're units of water? Because if you actually looked at them physically, there's going to be some differences. Like, let's say it's gallons. 
right? The, the third gallon and the fifth gallon, they're not exactly the same volume of water, right? Like if a chemist really got specific, they could say, oh, no, this thing is actually 1.01 gallons. And this one over here is actually 0.998 gallons. But what makes them interchangeable units of water is that from the actor's point of view, they're equally serviceable, right? That's the criterion. But it's not that you would choose one or the other because of indifference, okay? So again, it's just, I think Brian is, is misunderstanding the, the critique. And then I guess the last, I'll, I'll make two more points. So one is, I agree with Brian that, yeah, the reason I think it's important for the Austrians to remain, remain an independent, vibrant school of thought is that there are a lot of insights that I would have missed had I not studied the Austrian tradition. So my, specifically my work in capital and interest theory, I can, quote, translate the ideas of Bambavirk into a mainstream neoclassical model. That's what I did in my dissertation. I have a mathematical appendix to my verbal dissertation where I have a standard mainstream model with all the bells and whistles and I codify what I mean. And it, if I may, I thought it was pretty cool. Like I showed a too good model where interest is not the marginal product of capital. Like I, I showed what the expression was for the interest rate in that world where there's two goods. And then I said, oh, but let's suppose consumption and capital good are the same thing. And then I just showed my equation reduced to the equilibrium real interest rate equals the marginal product of capital if there's only one good. And so I was trying to show the mainstream when you're walking around in your models that we were taught at NYU and the, you know, standard for graduate students to learn in mainstream neoclassical economics, you're taught that, oh yeah, in equilibrium, the real wage rate equals the marginal product of labor, right? Like the derivative of the production function with respect to L. And the real interest rate equals the marginal product of the production function with respect to capital. And so that's why most mainstream economists right now think interest is due to the marginal product of capital and wages are due to the marginal product of labor. And that is completely anathema to the Austrian tradition. And so what I showed in my dissertation was, oh yeah, the mainstream economists are relying heavily on this one good model workhorse. If you had just two goods, that all goes away. So you can see, you know, the verbal logic of what Bambavrik is talking about, and I can illustrate it for you in a mainstream neoclassical model with utility functions and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I would never have gone down that path had I not read the verbal tradition of the Austrians talking about the pure time preference theory and having the verbal critique of what Bambavrik called a naive productivity theory. It wouldn't have occurred to me to even think about that. But once I knew verbally, wait a minute, something's screwy here. And I was looking at the mainstream equations because the math wasn't wrong, right? So the stuff we were learning at NYU in terms of the standard coursework was correct. And so I was just sitting there like as a grad student trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Because Von Vavrik's critique of the naive productivity theory of interest was correct. And yet the equations we were learning, you know, the calculus was right. And I was like, what the heck? And that's when I had my epiphany and realized, oh, it's because if there's only one good, which they had as a simplifying assumption in these mainstream models, then all the stuff Bambavrik worries about just collapses. Okay, so if you're curious, I can, I'll link to stuff I've written elsewhere in a, not as much of a technical thing. Uh, Pear Byland had a, a recent uh, collected, collection of essays come out and my essay in there goes over this stuff if you're curious, so I'll link to that. But anyway... My point is that, yeah, that I would not have, and, I, and I, by the way, I published that in a, it's a journal, The History of Economic Thought, but I, I published that just as a separate paper, you know, and Paul Samuelson was even the referee on that, okay? So I'm saying it's not that I was just talking to the choir of the Austrians and mainstream people would think that it wasn't rigorous. Like, I got it published and Paul Samuelson signed off on it and said, yeah, this is right as far as it goes, but, you know, I have my... Uh, things I would say in response, but he was acknowledging the validity of what I wrote. Okay, so again, I wouldn't have even thought about that had there not been this Austrian tradition that had been carried forward. Uh, 
And so then that kind of leads into Brian saying, stop worrying about what Hayek, Mises, and Rothbard really meant history of thought just doesn't matter much. I don't know what to say. I mean, to me, that's like if somebody said history doesn't matter much. And yeah, people writing about political science or whatever, you don't really need to study history. There's nothing there. All you need to know is just read the latest thinkers in terms of political philosophy and science and, you know, the way to design government institutions and so forth in terms of the literature of the last 10 years is really all you need. I mean, that would be completely naive and foolish. And so likewise, if, if it makes sense to, to know history in every other arena of life, why wouldn't you want to know the history of your discipline if you're an economist? And also, I would say it's much more important in the social sciences than it is in the physical or the natural sciences. Okay, so there is a sense in which if you want to teach a bunch of grad students the latest in quantum physics and um, cosmology and so on, I could see, you know, if someone said, there's no reason to go read Isaac Newton's in the original. There's no point in that. Fair enough. I, I could see someone saying that, and, and I wouldn't be horrified. But to say there's no point in going and reading the classical economist, I would disagree. And lately, for those of you who are on, fans of this podcast, the Human Action Podcast, you know that I have been going back and rereading a lot of that stuff and it is giving me fresh insights. So that's partly, and the, I guess this is what I'll wrap up on. The two things are related. The, the methodological issues I have with Brian, and then now this thing about the history of thought being irrelevant, those are related, right? It's because economics, I believe, is and was from the beginning a logical, deductive, you can call it science. That's why studying the history of thought is very important, particularly in economics, more so than it would be in, you know, mathematics or chemistry. I still think it is interesting and useful in those fields as well, but I'm just saying it's extra important in economics because it's not that we just have the feedback of, oh yeah, empirical results, make sure that at any given time, the models we're using are the most correct that we've discovered up till, up till now. That's, that's not the case. You can take wrong turns in the development of the social sciences, just like a lot of people think Freudian psychology was a bad idea and, and that you know, the discipline had to recover from that. And I think the Keynesian revolution was a bad idea and it's taken a long time for the profession to recover from that. It still hasn't fully. Okay, and so again, the reason these cul-de-sacs can happen in the social sciences is because you can have a bad theory and it's not as obvious as it would be in physics if someone just said, oh, I think electrons behave this way. And if you can just go do an experiment, you can pretty quickly show, no, something's wrong. Where you do see that is like arguments over string theory and stuff where if it like takes such high energies that they can't test it. And so you know, different schools can exist even in physics. But ultimately, they have the decisive criterion of observational feedback. But again, in the social sciences, you don't have that because there's not controlled experiments. So I think Brian Kaplan is wrong. It very much makes sense to go read the past economists, particularly the ones that have survived the test of time and are far more uh, important, I would say, than most of what is published today. That given, I would say it this way, I think you're going to be a much better economist if you spent on the margin more time reading uh, Bombavark and Mises and Hayek and Rothbard than if you read the last five issues of you know the Top Economics Journal. That that's going to give you a better grounding for you to then pick, even if you're going to just publish mathematical neoclassical models that just in terms of you framing the issues and trying to in your mind conceptually come up with what's an interesting question what is it that we're doing in economics and then yeah i gotta use all the bells and whistles of rational expectations and utility functions and blah 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 but what do i want to go do 
I would say you're going to get more inspiration and have better guidance reading the old school Austrians than just looking at the last few issues of the top journal and then saying, oh, I want to take this guy's model and just add, you know, this perturbation with it. That that's, to me, you're just going to be following the crowd rather than doing genuinely innovative, important work. Okay, well, I'll stop there. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.